Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. Hi. Hi. There's we are enjoying a beautiful day. We are. It's May. It is another beautiful day. Can you day. even believe it's May? I cannot believe it's Summer May. Summer is almost here, and you know what that means. Roller coasters. It means I turn into a 12-year-old, pretty much, for like three months. Because I nerd out about roller coasters, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an episode right now. <laughs> um, so I take my kids. I have three kids. Zach is 21, Nick is almost 19, and Allie is 15. And the four of us and my sister and my 18-year-old nephew, Jorgen, go to Cedar Point every summer. And oh. Cedar Point, if you don't know Cedar Point, it is, it is Mecca for roller coaster enthusiasts. See, there you go. Yeah, it's all world-class record-breaking coasters. And so we go, stay on property. It's beautiful. It's in northern Ohio. It's on Lake Erie. It's like you're just immersed in theme park for, you know, three days. But it's particularly roller coaster theme park. Specifically roller coaster theme park, yeah. If you like roller coasters, this is the place to go. The thing that we are particularly excited about this year is Steel Vengeance. And Steel Vengeance is a, is a coaster that is a, a hybrid, meaning that it is built on a wooden frame, but it has steel tracks, so it rides like a steel coaster, but it is supported on a wooden frame. So it has some of the characteristics of a wooden coaster. For instance, it's not going to do a straight-up loop, because a wooden coaster wouldn't do that. But what they did at Cedar Point, they took an existing wooden coaster that they had that wasn't one of the most popular rides, needed a little bit of, or a lot of work, and they closed it down. And they didn't tell anybody what they were doing. So they just, like, closed it down. And all the, the fans are like, what's going on? And they made a big deal about closing it down. They did a funeral of sorts. I was going to ask you whether there was a funeral. And they funeral? did a procession through the park. Cedar Point is on an island, essentially, and it was way on the back side of the island, and they processed all the way through the park to the front part of the park, and they did, a, a, like, a burial there of sorts. And then during their Halloween weekends, they have markers for all the dead roller coasters. And so there's a marker for Mean Streak. And nobody knew what they were going to do. Like, are they just going to leave this, this shell of a, of a magnificent coaster just sitting here like this? And so they didn't say anything. But then once the park closed in the fall, these vans started to appear. And on the side of the van was RMC. And RMC stands for Rocky Mountain Construction. And Rocky Mountain Construction has been rehabbing coasters. And they have a, a reputation now of creating awesome coasters out of these wooden frames. Okay. And they came in, and they were still no announcement. Yeah. And, like, all the coaster freaks are just, like, freaking out. They're like, what's going on? RMC vans. Pictures are being taken, you know, it's like spy photos. Of the vans. Of the vans. So we know they're there. Something is happening. No announcement. And so my kids and I, we, we go back last summer, and clearly there's work being done, and yet still no announcement. That's right, because this was like almost two years ago that yeah. they shut it down. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. But the week after we went, there was a bit of a reveal. They gave enough of the news that said, you know, Main Street is being rehabbed. RMC is doing it. It will be a hybrid. We'll have more details later. And then everybody lost their minds. So uh, Steel Vengeance opens this weekend to the public. And so we get to ride it. And they've already done a press junket. They've had, you know, reporters on there terrified writing. And there's pictures of, you know, people aghast. And they're like, ah. And then, like, <laughs> all the Instagrammers are saying, it's, it's way beyond all the hype. It's 10 out of 10. It's 11 out of 10. It's amazing. You know, and so everybody is hyped about the coaster. And it is kind of amazing. So if you, if you care about roller coasters at all, go online and Google Steel Vengeance. There's a point of view, POV video where you can virtually ride it. Cedar Point does not erect a new coaster without giving it world-class record-breaking features, and this one has some. So I'm nerding out about that, and now, super excited. When are you guys gonna be there? We're gonna be there June 3rd through 6th. So I'm betting, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or just leave this right out, that if any of our fans are up there that weekend, yeah. you would love to meet them. I sure would. And maybe talk to them about coasters or God or life Anything. or whatever. Anything. Yeah. Okay. By all means, if you are 
in that neck of the woods that weekend, mm -hmm. you should come to Cedar Point and check it out. We're going to be at the park on that Monday, the 4th, and Tuesday, the 5th. Okay. Uh, Cocktail Theology doesn't have an Instagram account, but you can follow Benton's Instagram account at, at Benton Stokes. Yes, you can. And I feel confident there will be pictures. There so will you be could, so you many might, pictures. You might even be able to track him down yeah. through pictures or through Twitter. Or through Twitter. At, at Benton dot. Is it dot? No. The no. dot's on Facebook. The dot's on Facebook. Okay, so no at dot. Benton Stokes. Benton Stokes, yeah. Okay. I, I wish people could see you when you're talking about summer and talking about this because it's kind of like the opposite of big Right? I told you I'm going to be 12 for like well, three months. Well, that's it. And what happens is Tom Hanks' voice is coming out of a little boy rather mm -hmm. than a little... Anyway. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, it's wonderful. Well, it's fun. So, yeah. But before that, because that's June, before that, we have a retreat coming up. It's called God for Recovering Evangelicals. Everybody that I know, myself included, that has gone through uh, this material has left profoundly changed just because it sort of spins you around and has you look at how you look at God. That's a great way to How put it. you've been looking at God. Right. And I just think it's incredibly valuable. I hope that many, many people will take advantage of this course. It's going to be fun. Now, I say many, many, but we have a limited 16. number of seats total. available. 16 in total. We're going to be at the Earhart House, and it's May 18th through 20th. You can register at our schoolforseekers.com website. And if you register before the 10th. Which is today. Which is today. You get $100 off. I highly recommend that you go and sign up now. So if you're on your computer, what would be the smart thing to do right now is to open up another window, keep listening to us, go to www.schoolforseekers.com and register for the retreat today, today. before midnight, yep. so you can save $100. But even if you're paying $395, it's three days. It's three days of teaching, it's three days of worship, it's three days of communion, it's three days of quiet out here in in wonderful bucolic Hermitage, Tennessee, just 15 minutes from the airport. And it's food that you don't have to make. Right. And company you don't have to gather. And it's us. And it's us, In the flesh. And it'll be fun. It we'll is. have worship time. We'll have quiet time. We'll have laughter and conversation. It'll be really, really valuable time. And your view of yourself and of God will change. It is a springboard for change. It will. So, yeah. So please, please come join us. It's May. It's May. So excited. Now tell us, what are we drinking today, Lane? So we are out in the middle of the day, it should be pointed out. And we can't do anything really heavy in the middle of the day just because it doesn't taste right in the middle of the day. So what we are doing, and because I insist upon us, you know, being sober throughout the whole thing. So <laughs> we are drinking... Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that part should have <laughs> Uh, so today we are drinking Bombay Sapphire, a little bit of that, and a little bit of elderflower um, syrup. We're not using liqueur because that would weight it down too much. And dry cucumber soda. Well, it's delicious. It's refreshing, right? It's very refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Bombay, the sapphire is actually great for this because it's not soft. And so it, it gives some counterpoint to the, mm -hmm. to the soda and to the elderflower. So. Well, it's yummy. It it's is really yummy. really good. So yeah. But today we're going to talk about... What does a good person do with political power? Which was a very interesting question. It is. And we should give credit where credit is due. So our friend on Facebook, Jesus Ben Yosef, very smart guy, and not just because he's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Smart guy. <laughs> he's been in the temptation in the desert. Okay. So he's been musing about what does it mean to be given complete power, turning rocks into bread, you know, jumping off of skyscrapers and having angels catch you. What, is, what does that mean? So that's where he's going into this. Okay. What does a good person do when given political power? So I immediately went to Plato. As okay. I do. As, <laughs> as one does. As one does. <laughs> one immediately goes to Plato. <laughs> now notice I said Plato rather than Plato because that could confuse people. That, yes, we're not talking about the goo. We're talking about the <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just so we're clear. So Plato's big masterpiece, I mean, Plato just basically wrote masterpieces, but the big one is called The Republic. You may have heard of it. I have. Basically what Plato is doing is philosophizing about society and about the way government should be run and the nature of reality and all that stuff. He's a very integrated philosopher. Mm -hmm. He really sees in terms of worldviews. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that he poses in this and in many other places, is he poses the question of who should be the ruler of a republic. Hmm. 
And the problem that one of his characters lifts up is that anyone who wants to be ruler probably shouldn't be ruler. Ah. And the people who should be rulers are people who have lived self-examined lives, who have mm. thought about what's good and what's evil, mm -hmm. who, you know, philosophers. Mm -hmm. Like himself. Like himself. And, and he does, both in the Republic and other places, muse about the fact that a reluctant philosopher is probably the best ruler of a republic. The idea being that a good person uh -huh. who's thought about it, uh -huh. not a complete naive, becomes the ruler of the republic. And that's the person you want. Now we'll go into what, what counts as a good person in a minute, but a very interesting point of view. That is very interesting, and I totally see that. You want to think that we would be capable of electing a ruler, a leader, mm -hmm. who would be selfless and who would put the desires, needs, more mm -hmm. specifically needs, of the republic ahead of his or her own, mm -hmm. right? But the very nature of our political system... You mean ours now, not Plato's I mean ours now, sorry. Yeah. Our American well, political fine. system. In order to jump through all the hoops that you jump through and in order to become the media personality that you have to become, you kind of have to really want it. I mean... To put yourself, your family, your loved ones through that, plus the scrutiny that everything about you and your history and your family goes through and every bit of it and all the money, good gosh, the money, you have to really want it. And in order to really want it, at that point, you just have to, you, a person would have to examine his or her own motives for why they want it and why they would be willing to go through that. See, and I think you're already kind of leaning in Plato's direction, even though you're recognizing the issues, because your assumption is that a person would have to think about it, would have to acknowledge it, would have to struggle through it. I, I, I'm afraid I'm a little bit of a cynic on this. I don't think most people who run for high political office, maybe not even for low political office, think about the morality of doing it one whit. Mm. They might think about whether they can get their families to come along. Yeah. They might think about whether it would be good for their kids. I can imagine thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I can imagine them trying to do the calculus, right? right. Is this going to be good for my kids? Will my marriage survive it? I don't think there are that many people who run for high political office or even moderate political office in our country who are inclined to spend any depth of time thinking about that. Wow. Now, I could be really wrong. No, again, I, I, again, I mean, I, I do have a little bit of leaning towards cynicism. Well, in these days, and I don't know, maybe it's been this way historically too, but it seems as though if you show a certain proclivity toward being a political leader, you're almost drafted into the position too. So in other words, there are people that are ready to elevate you to that. Sure. They, they see something in you, whether it's just their own self-interest being, you know, oh, this is a person that could help me get this done. Or this is a person that's willing to tow this particular line or carry this particular flag. So I will put my endorsement, money, energy, time behind this person. Which further complicates somebody coming to their own conclusions about what they believe, what they want, what they think is best for the country, their families, and themselves. Yeah. I, I hate to put in a pitch for our retreat at this moment, but one of the reasons we do this whole conversation about what is it you believe is because when we are in a crisis, and by that I just mean any form of real stress, it can be a good crisis, right? Sure. You're about to have a baby, you're excited, yeah. right? Um, it can be a bad crisis. But when we're in crisis, we don't have the mental capacity or the time uh -huh. to think about what do we believe, uh -huh. what matters to us. So it's better to do that ahead of time. And that's what we do in that retreat is really start kind of grappling with what do we believe? Right, you know, we do. You know. And that's May 18th through 20th for anybody who missed the top of the hour. So there are a lot of things you said that I think are worth lifting up, at least for now. So one of them was you were qualifying our political process as opposed to potentially Plato's political process. Right. Process, okay? Right. There's no question that democracy was young in Plato's time. It mm -hmm. was still kind of a new idea. The Athenians were practicing it. Some would say the Athenians failed at it. But that's what they were doing. But I think it is important to notice that Plato understood that the person would be a reluctant philosopher. 
Mm. So even then, the people who are self-promoting or who are charismatic mm -hmm. are going to be the ones who aim for more visible positions. Yes. And Plato certainly realized that. The second thing I wanted to comment on is that as you were talking about people on the outside seeing the characteristics of a leader or seeing the charisma or seeing whatever it is and sort of sweeping the person along through it, I mean, that's, that's straight out of the gospel, right? Mm. Jesus is standing there and there's that scripture that says, knowing that they were about to crown him king, mm. he, he, they don't say sped off into the woods, but you get the kind of feeling that he like sneaked out backwards and then hauled butt. Right. Looking that they were going to crown him king. This is kind of a sidebar, but then would you say, willing to be or not, that Jesus was a political figure? Sure. I don't think there's anything that's apolitical. Mm -hmm. I really adhere to the original meaning of political, that sense of the polis, the sense of the people. Mm -hmm. So people in interaction in public are essentially political. Mm -hmm. Now, they aren't necessarily partisan, and they aren't necessarily pro or con any particular issue. Yep. But by interacting in public, we are political creatures. Yeah. And then if you think about first century Palestine or first century Jerusalem or first century Rome, however you want to think about it, you've got a people who are sort of in exile, but they're definitely in an occupied country. Mm -hmm. They're waiting to be unoccupied. Mm -hmm. They're waiting for the return of King David in some form or another to come and get the silly Romans out of Jerusalem. Hmm. Yeah. Right? So, you know, and they've been waiting for this for a very long time. Leaders have come, leaders have gone, they've drafted in leaders to do it, leaders have fallen, leaders have been crucified. This has been going on for a very long time. Jesus comes along and the people who are following him go, that one must be it. Mm. And I have to admit, again, this is the sidebar to the sidebar. Sure. If I were of the ruling class or of the kind of separate from all of this happening, watching it, if I were a reporter in that time, I'd be thinking... Oh, look, they've picked a new one. Oh, uh, wow, yeah. So, today, the crowds outside of the Jerusalem gate have selected a new representative, mm -hmm. a new speaker for them, mm -hmm. for Jewish Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Right. This one, they assure us, <laughs> will be the one mm -hmm. who will bring peace, comfort, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I think this is a human thing. I think it's made more public and more visible and perhaps more painful because we see it in such a big way now, right? Mm -hmm. If you were on the outskirts of Athens and they were electing a new governor, you wouldn't have the foggiest clue that they were doing that. You just wouldn't care because it would be a bunch of guys all gathered up voting, right? You, could only, you had to be a citizen and property owner and all those things, much like the beginning of our little republic. Yep. So the outside person isn't going to be paying any attention to that, right? Yeah. For at least the presidential candidacy in this country at this time, it's pretty hard to avoid. You can <laughs> yeah, be, it's pretty You can impossible. be living off the grid and still be caught up in, so who's going to be running, who's going to be president? Now, you might ignore them once they get elected, mm -hmm. but it's pretty hard to avoid. And the campaigning goes on for so long, Ugh. for so many months. I mean, they start campaigning the minute after somebody's elected, right? right. But I don't think the essential problem of... Anyone who wants this job shouldn't have it. Or at least anyone who thinks they want this job should do some real soul searching about why they want this job. I don't think that's a new idea. It would be interesting to look historically at the American presidents and how each of them came into the office, who they were before, mm -hmm. what set of circumstances put them there, mm -hmm. what kind of climate was going on in the country that mm -hmm. that person would be elected. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain hinge pin presidents that we talk about or that, that get noted a lot in history, and, and understandably and rightfully so, like Abraham Lincoln, for instance, and um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and people who were elected into position during times in this country where strong leadership was necessary, like extraordinary leadership was necessary right. in order for the country to come out on the other side and still be what it is. Right. Not that it wasn't changed, because it was. Absolutely. The Republic changed after Lincoln. The Republic changed after Roosevelt. Because it really is not only about the individual, it's about the zeitgeist, too. It's about what's going on in the country. Because whoever we elect to that office is put there to sort of fix whatever problems the majority sees are there. 
Yes. Or the the people who elect the president, whether that's the majority or not. Right. Yeah, I would include Ronald Reagan in that. Oh, yeah, I would um, too. You know, because for exactly those same reasons. He was elected at a time when people felt pushed down and made minimal during a time when inflation was double digits, yep. during a time when we had hostages in what felt like a very foreign country. And he came in and changed the zeitgeist. Yes. Right? Yeah. Now, again, whether you like Lincoln or you like Reagan or you like FDR, they were elected because something was shifting. I think that's a better way to that's, put it. That's a good way to put it. They were elected because something was already shifting. And they became then the banner carriers of that shift. And, and Reagan, having lived through the Reagan years, I was a teenager, but the global climate was particularly volatile right then. Mm -hmm. we, we had stuff going on in the Middle East. We had stuff going on with Russia that was terrifying. We had China rising. We had the Berlin Wall coming down. We had all this. When I think about Reagan, besides Reaganomics and what was going on economically in the country, I think about the global stuff because there was so much that had to be diffused, figured out. We needed a strong global face. And Reagan, like him or not, was such a charismatic personality. He could pretty much charm anybody from what you could see as a outside, way outsider as a kid. I, I found him to be incredibly charismatic, regardless of what his politics were. And so he could meet with world leaders that differed sharply with him, and he got things done. And somehow you, you want to think that it was the wisdom of the people that put him there, that they saw that. Don't know. Don't know if we're that smart. Because we've elected some stinkers. We've elected some people that got nothing done or set us back. You think about Andrew Jackson, for example? Andrew Jackson was a, was a rascal. That's one way to put it. He was a rascal. And his home was uh, 10 minutes from here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, the community we're in is named for his home. Hermitage. That's right. Fascinating guy. But, wow, a hothead. Yeah. But Those happy slaves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were treated they so were well. They were so happy. They um, were all happy until they got freed, and then they weren't happy and anymore. They, and then they weren't happy anymore, yeah. And then what about the argument where, because I've heard pastors say this my whole life, God chooses who our leaders are. People are put in power because God puts them there. What do you think about that? Personally, I think the divine right of kings was a way for kings to explain why they had the divine right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any difference in that. My theology about that is God wants us to work our stuff out. Mm -hmm. God really entrusts this little world to us. Mm -hmm. And so whether God puts a particular ruler in power or not, mm -hmm. God entrusts that to us. Right. So if you want to see everything that happens in the world as a positive act of God, meaning God has done it, then sure, you betcha. Or if you want to see God's plan as a big blueprint from which we cannot deviate, then sure, you betcha. I don't happen to buy either of those things. Right, I don't either. I think that there are probably rulers whom God has purposefully helped us pay attention to. I, I don't like the language of God puts a democratically elected person in power because I don't like the idea of God messing with ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. There's something about that that mm -hmm. strikes me really anti-God. Mm -hmm. However, I do believe that God can lead and will lead God's people to pay attention to something in particular. Yeah. So that makes sense. And then we can choose to do that or not. Right. Right. I want to go back though. Reagan is a really interesting one on this. If we can stay there for just a yeah, minute. Yeah, sure. So the contrast between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan is a really clear contrast in a way that we don't often get such clear contrasts. How one felt about the two men is telling. Not were they good, were they bad, none of that, but how you felt about them. Mm. One of the things I've heard political operatives talk about is if you're running for president of the United States, people have to feel like they could go out and get a beer with you. And that would be a normal kind of thing. Wow. So if you look back over presidents since Nixon, uh -huh. there's a little, well, shucks, 
to all of them, mm. with the possible exception of Obama. But mm -hmm. Obama had a well shucks in a certain way to intellectuals. Yes. Right. Yes. And and the world was in massive flux at that uh -huh. moment. So, but all of them had that well shucks. So there's that idea that you could go out and have a beer with them. Mm -hmm. Imagining that Jimmy Carter drank for just a moment. Mm -hmm. Both those men had some of that. Mm -hmm. The question is which one you'd want to go out and have a beer with. Wow, yeah. And I could talk about why I liked one, didn't like the other, what the legacy of one versus the other is. But I think that that's a really interesting, clear comparison. Because I do believe if you were on the political left, and I mean, you know, vaguely on the political left, or if you were a certain kind of evangelical Christian, which doesn't really exist much anymore, mm -hmm. you felt that Jimmy Carter was a good man. Yeah. You might think he was an incompetent president, but you felt like he was a good man. Uh -huh. I think that for moderates and people on the right, mm -hmm. you felt like deep down Reagan was a good man. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for many people, maybe just outside the state of California or outside the state of Georgia, I'll take mm -hmm. both of them out, mm -hmm. it was really sort of a choice between competency, incompetency, views, but not about good. Yeah. If that yeah. makes sense. No, it does make sense, sure. So I think that's a really telling one. And so if we assume that both those men were good, to get back to Jesus Ben Yosef's mm -hmm. question, the question is, what does a good person do with political power? Yep. Those are two very interesting examples. Two very different people, personalities. Approaches. Approaches. The, <laughs> the movie Wall Street. Yeah. Where... The main character says greed is good. Yeah. That could not have come out when Jimmy Carter was president. It no. just couldn't have come out. Uh -uh. Because it wasn't the way we thought about money, about the republic, about uh -huh. all those things. Uh -huh. Right. One could argue that yellow ribbons on trees for 400 and odd days would not have happened under Reagan's watch because people wouldn't have had that kind of country sentimentality. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. you just get this very different zeitgeist with mm -hmm. the two men. Right. So. so then what happens to the zeitgeist, say, for instance, so the country elects Jimmy Carter, and obviously the zeitgeist was a particular way to have elected him. The shift that happened during the four years that then would allow for Reagan to become president next, how much of that zeitgeist shift is the leader responsible for, would you say? I'm not a political theorist, right? I mean, I, I've taught political theory, but I'm not a political theorist. Just play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're just drinking gin and talking about yeah. it. <laughs> well, except, you know, I actually got paid to do this for a while. <laughs> not, not that I was any good at it, <laughs> but I did do it. I tend to think that presidential elections, particularly because they're obvious, are always reactive. Ah, okay. So we came out of Nixon and Ford, mm -hmm. and the sense that basic core values had been violated by some set of people. And whether you thought it was the Democrats, or you thought it was the Republicans, the way Nixon behaved was pretty clearly at least smarmy, if not illegal. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Ford immediately walked in and pardoned Nixon, which made people who were paying attention kind of go, ah! Right. Mm -hmm. So Carter was elected after that. And I think Carter was, again, so aw shucks that he didn't feel smarmy in the same way. Mm -hmm. You might not like him, might not like his policies, all that, but it had a different texture. I think Carter was a response mm -hmm. to Nixon and Ford. I think Reagan was a response to Carter. Yeah. People didn't like being told to put on a sweater. Mm. If your house is cold, put on a sweater. Mm -hmm. They didn't like it. They wanted Nancy to go out and spend $188,000 on a new set of dishes, even though there mm. were 5,000 sets of dishes. Yeah. They wanted to feel... Here's my example. You ready for this? Okay. Okay. Height of the Depression, mm -hmm. glory days of MGM musicals, and beautiful people dressed well in the movies. I never realized those happened simultaneously. Simultaneously. Really? Yes. So the golden age of, of MGM happened in the middle of the Depression. Mid-30s to mid-40s, yeah. late, late 40s. But here's why. People want to imagine themselves being able to get there. Yeah. So we see a man in white tux and tails, and we see a woman in a gown, and they're just enough like us, just tiny enough like us that we can sort of imagine that someday this horrible time will pass. Yeah. To be really cynical, and since I'm apparently on a cynical road, so Dallas Willard's mom, when she was dying, and he was two, said to her husband, keep eternity in front of the children. Hmm. There's something about top hat tails and ball gowns that is keeping eternity in front of the children. Wow, yeah. 
right? People want to aspire. We want mm. to feel aspirational. We want to feel as though our situation will be better. Will be better. I don't think it's weird mm -hmm. <laughs> at all that The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind came out as color movies with a magical overtone when they did. 1939. I don't think it was about technology. I think it was about zeitgeist. Yeah. Since you're a popular culture well, that's, guy. That's funny because, okay, so we had a conversation, you and I had a conversation yesterday with a friend of mine. And one of the things that she pointed out was that she finds herself watching the Hallmark Channel a lot. And she talked about how Hallmark has created really a formula for successful movies for their genre, for their format. Mm -hmm. And they just keep turning them out. Yep. And they're employing actors that are likable and recognizable. Even There's even mm -hmm. a sense of nostalgia tied to some Absolutely. of these actors. Most of them were big in the 80s. Most of them were big in the 80s. So they know their audience. Yep. And... What she said was, she watches those movies to escape. Mm -hmm. And she pointed out that it's a means for her to get away from the news and everything else that's going on. She can turn everything else off and immerse herself for two hours in a Hallmark movie and feel transported mm -hmm. somewhere else where she doesn't have to think about or look at any of that. And she said in those movies, there's never any bloodshed even if it's a murder mystery it's very it's dealt tidy yeah it's very tidy it's all about the intrigue it's not about mm -hmm. the episode whatever happened and and how she believes and i think this is right particularly people from our generation really crave and everybody does escapism from what's going on currently a lot of these movies and series are set in a small town mm -hmm. they're in their own insulated kind of bubble safe safe from everything else that's going on. And aspirational to something we never actually had. And incredibly aspirational. Right. Mayberry. We all... Now see, I... <laughs> Mayberry always freaked me out. <laughs> because if you flushed in Mayberry, everybody knew it. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody was married except the town drunk. That is an interesting observation, yeah. Just saying. Yeah. But I do think that there is something about that. There's a particular kind of both nostalgia and aspiration that happens and particularly if we feel as human beings that we've been put down mm -hmm. so going back going back to jesus mm -hmm. which we are want to do mm -hmm. going back to jesus jesus was nostalgia for david whom most of them had never known david was a was a legend yeah and aspiration that's who jesus was wow from a personal point of view uh -huh. so of course you would want to make him king mm -hmm. because you'd have you know palestinian mayberry mm -hmm. again yeah. Everything would be right with the world. I've seen a number lately, well, over the last year, a number of TV shows and movies that are basically paradise gone wrong. Like I just watched uh, Suburbicon. Dystopia is big. Dystopia is big, where you have, you have Mayberry, and then the black family moves in, and then all hell breaks loose, and right. then all this other stuff starts happening. And so basically right. what it's doing is it's peeling back the layers of what looks like utopia to what's really going on. That's right. And so we've, we've seen a lot of that in pop culture, and it seems like it's increasing even more. So there's this, this one kind of subgenre of entertainment that, that lifts up the aspirational and says, here. Mm -hmm. And then there's this other subgenre of entertainment that kind of says, yeah, here's this, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shake this up for you. There's a line, I forgot who said, I want to save Voltaire, but I could be making that up, that cynics are disappointed romantics. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So if you think about the aspirational as being the romantic view and the dystopia as being the cynical view, mm -hmm. both are looking, both are aching for a reality they don't know. Mm -hmm. One thinks that it used to exist and we've got to reclaim it. The other thinks that it never existed and we've got to claim it or make it. And yeah. that's how we vote. And I think that's how we elect leaders. And that's how we select part. I mean, I really, I really think there's something very, very deep about this. I mean, I hate to go back to Eden on this one, but take Adam and Eve for a minute. Mm -hmm. They are in the middle of utopia, right? They are on a first name basis with God. Mm -hmm. God walks among them. They are innocent as infants. They have no sense of whether naked is good or bad. Naked just is, right? Mm -hmm. They can eat anything. They have one rule. The one rule is don't eat that because it will hurt you. Yeah. Not a bad rule, as right. rules go. Then in comes this voice that says, 
See that one telling you that this will hurt you? That cannot be trusted. Mm hmm Okay? That's dystopia. When you peel back the layers, your benevolent ruler's not so benevolent. Yeah. So they listen to the dystopia, and they see their utopia collapse. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, now what? Yeah. And how you read what happens afterwards says a whole lot about how you view that very first part. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is the aspirational is what, is what we're reaching for when we cast a vote. We may be. Mm -hmm. We may be. I, I think that, that if somebody latches onto the aspirational, they're good to go. So our current president, Donald Trump, reached into an aspirational that was you who used to have power felt as though you did can have power again, can have the life you expected again. You can have these things again that you expected to have and, mm -hmm. no, and don't have. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent, you don't have it. I will restore this to you, and I'm the only one who can do it. Right. If you look at Obama, his aspirational was, we can be better than this. We as a country can be better than this. We can be more influential in the best possible way. Not important, but influential. Mm -hmm. We can blah, 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 mm -hmm. right? Two different sets of aspiration. Mm -hmm. But both, whether they did in a cynical way or an, a romantic way, it doesn't matter. They were both pulling on people's aspirations yeah. and their fears. Whether I liked Obama or not, and I didn't always like Obama at all, there was some fear in that. Mm -hmm. Look where we could be going. Yeah. Here's where we are. And unless we get our act together in this mm -hmm. particular way and mm -hmm. aim towards hope and aim towards change. Right. Right. I mean, there's always, there's always the fear side, right? Yeah. How do we know that the next person we elect is a good person? We don't. How do we do our best to cast our vote for someone that we think is closest to being a good person? Do we base it on what their issues are? Do we base it on what their, their history says? Do we base it on what their demeanor says? Do we base it on how humble they are or aren't? How confident they are or aren't? How willing they are to talk about their weaknesses or not? What do you count as a good person? What makes a good person for you? In positions where I've been in leadership before and currently, even over, even, well, maybe especially with my kids, I have always gone into that being willing, at least cerebrally willing, to be the person that lays it down. What do if you it mean comes by that? To, if it comes to worst, something happens, and somebody takes the fall, it's going to be me because I'm in leadership. I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's the way that I approach leadership and have traditionally approached leadership. I would like to think that whoever we elect would do that. And it's funny because it's like some of these dystopian movies that we've talked about recently, there have been presidents depicted as cowards and there have been presidents depicted as noble where, you know, the aliens are coming and so the president gives himself up. Or puts the baby in front of him. Or puts the baby in front of him, right. right. And it's like, I want, I want the president that will give himself up. To me, that is a character indicator when the greater good is more important. But how do you know that? I mean, people can say that. People can present that as that's what they would do. And we've had leaders who have, and we've had leaders who haven't. But to me, that would be one indicator of a good person. Having a good person elected would be somebody that was willing to put the greater good first. Let's play with that for a minute, if you don't mind. Sure. Let's imagine a battlefield because it's easy. It's visual. It's an old-style battlefield. Mm -hmm. You're facing the bad guy, mm -hmm. whoever the bad guy is. And both Game sides of Thrones. Are, yeah, sure. I've never seen Game of Thrones, but whatever. Um, I know, I know. I don't have cable! <laughs> Just need to say that to everybody. I don't have cable. <laughs> but you're facing each other. Something happens on the left-hand side peoples where something massively goes wrong. Mm-hmm. The leader says, completely my fault. I am going to lay it down for this group. 
It is my responsibility. I'm going to do my best, but here I am going to fall on my sword. So the leader goes out. Leader gets shot down by the other side. Then they have no leader. They have no leader. One of the challenges of people who will lay it all down Mm -hmm. is sometimes you need somebody who isn't going to do that. Mm -hmm. Who isn't going to do that. Mm -hmm. Who is going to say instead, yeah, I effed up and we still need to move forward. And I will take my lumps if we lose. And in my mind, that's still somebody that's willing to lay it down. But you understand my point. I do. I understand the distinction. Yeah. Right. And I do think that one of the things that happens in churches and probably happens in lower level politics is that the really good, the really good pastors, the really mm-hmm. nice ones, you know, go out, they fall on their swords. They wonder then why people step on them mm-hmm. and then are hurt because they weren't, you know, well, of course, you don't need to be a doormat. Yeah. Right? Jesus was no doormat. No, you're right. No. For me, there's something in between that kind of, no one's going to know this reference, but the Casper Milk Toast doormat and the humble leader, right? Mm-hmm. Who does see the greater good as being more important. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, mm-hmm. but how do you elect them? How do you tell? You know, I have a couple of litmus test issues, and I fully admit that. One of them is do you think the poor should remain poor? And if not, do you think it's all of us in it or the poor who need to be responsible for that? Mm -hmm. I'm all about the all of us. Mm -hmm. And I am unwilling to say, well, that poor person is needy and worthy and that poor person is not needy or worthy. I'm not willing to do that right? because I am not good at judging that and I don't think anybody is. So the view you take of poverty, both uplifting, strengthening, and pushing people who need that, Mm-hmm. And understanding that it is a social issue that mm-hmm. we all benefit from people being better off. Mm-hmm. To me, that's kind of a bottom line test. I have a couple of other political things, but for me, that's like, that's the bottom one. You got to have a, we are bigger than me view. Yeah. But from then, honestly, one of the things I do is I look at newspapers and news from 10 years before. Mm-hmm. What were people saying about the character of the person then? Then. Yeah. What does the person look like when the paparazzi take a picture? Mm-hmm. What does that person look like when they don't expect to be seen? Yeah. To me, that tells me more about the character of the person. Sure. And one of the reasons I personally had trouble in this last election was what do they look like when they don't think they're being seen wasn't fantastic for either one of them. One was right. significantly worse. But it wasn't fantastic for either one of them. Right. Yeah, you're right. So it was like, oh, okay. All right, well crap. <laughs> now, I heard so many people say, there's not a candidate for me. There's no one in this, in this election that I can vote for. Right. A lot of people said that. And not even when it got down to two. I mean, like when there was a spate on both sides, nobody said, this is my person. I had so many people, friends of mine, who vote on both sides of the spectrum say, mm-hmm. I'm having a really hard time getting behind anybody. Yeah. I think it says a lot about where we are as a culture that we couldn't find a good person or at least a good person on each side to elevate somehow so that the decision that we had was between two really, truly decent people who were flawed but decent. And I heard a lot of people say and argue that neither of these people is decent and I'm not going to vote, right. which puts us all in a very difficult spot. Right. It makes it difficult to trust the American people to, to even choose people that can be elected to that office who have that sort of integrity that we're talking about. Well, and it has been said that we get the government we deserve. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that part of the challenge is that dystopia is the zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. And if an actually good person... If King David came along, we'd either say, yeah, he took Bathsheba, Mm -hmm. as he should have as king, or we'd say, oh, he took Bathsheba, then killed, you know, Mm -hmm. rather than the scope of David. Right. I've heard my whole life, vote your conscience. And conscience, to me, is a very shifty character. (laughs) (laughs) Because conscience, to me, in my experience is situational. I have an inner compass, 
But conscience is a broader thing the way that I see it, the way that I've experienced conscience. Because I, I distinguish conscience from the Holy Spirit, for instance. The Holy Spirit, to me, is a different type of guidance than conscience. Okay. Conscience, to me, is, is colored by the situation that I'm in, where my brain space has been for the last days, hours, weeks, whatever. And many times is the lesser of two evils. And so what does your conscience say in those cases? Well, see, me, <laughs> we're me, about being you. The per- me being the person that tends to freeze in those situations. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times the decision gets made because I don't make one. I don't either have a strong leading from the divine or I don't trust my instincts, my slash conscience. And so I'm not going to make this decision. And I may not make the decision to not make the decision. I may just let it time out. And then something happens. And then I deal with the blowback, whatever that is. I have a hard time believing that the American people have a conscience that's reliable. Certainly not as a unit, correct. Right. So it really becomes divisions against one another. Yep. And each division has its own response to a particular personality. Yep. And so it really comes down to which division overpowers the other. Today. Today. See, and here's what I would say. I agree with you completely that we are divided in that way that each group has its own desires, affinities, whatever. And this is why you watch dystopian things and I don't. Mm, yeah. I look at that and say, yes, of course, that's always been true. But there is no one group that holds all the power, so we see it. Mm-hmm. The nostalgic 50s, the people who held all the power were, you know, white men with money. Yeah, right. They hold a lot of the power now, but not all of it. Uh Uh-huh. And so we see, in fact, factions. Because there isn't that same kind of gross hegemony, sorry for the big language, that gross, the only voice you hear is Carnegie. Mm -hmm. We are much more aware that we, as a country are a collection of tribal factions. Mm -hmm. And that scares the bejesus out of us because we were under the illusion that it was something else. Yeah. So the question is, as people, are we going to say, wow, your tribe and I disagree on nearly everything, but we want some decency. How do we get decency? How do we figure that out together? I wish I felt confident that all of the divisions and factions in our country wanted decency. And I won't quote Romans right now. (laughs) Okay. Right? I mean, it's Paul. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's Babel, right? Yeah. That's where I do think that your, your image of the best leaders being the person who will think of the greater good is so important and so accurate because when you are trying to align tribes you have to have people who are willing to say we will give up this for that Mm -hmm. it is not as important that we be right as that your baby gets fed or whatever the thing is yeah plato not the goo the philosopher May 18th through 20th here in hermitage tennessee very close to the nashville airport think nashville on three acres of grass and trees and birds and bring your antihistamines <laughs> and but we will talk about what is it you actually believe what do you really believe what would your actions say that you believe no matter what you think you believe and it all starts with what you believe about god and it all starts with what you believe about god www.schoolforseekers.com there it is there it is hope to see you Bye. Bye.